the patrons of this conference, the director of NIT Goa and the director of NITK Suratkan, the delegates, the professors from different institutes and universities of national importance, Professor Jodi from Tamagawa University, Tokyo, Professor Kini from Indiana University, the US, my dear colleagues, to the two-day international conference on sustainable learning, strategies and consequences in digital India. We are glad that you have all responded to our call and accepted our invitation despite the ongoing challenges. Dr. Sheen of NITK Suratkal and I have chosen this broad area for several reasons. Because the persistent grip of the pandemic has changed the entire scenario of teaching and learning. Also, it has been creating new application-based jobs. Overall, we are in a state of flux now and I'm sure all facilitators are trying to adopt new approaches to meet the needs of the stakeholders. The key areas of this conference are teaching pedagogy in the COVID and in the post-COVID, recent changes in pedagogy, recent trends in management, national education policy, and ELT. The objective of this conference is to have a fruitful deliberation followed by the action plans in the above mentioned areas so that the uncertainties of the future will not pose a challenge to us. With this, I would like to introduce our director, Professor Mugeraya. It was his idea to organize the conference where we can blend management and humanities. Professor Gopal Mugeraya obtained his BTEC and MTEC in chemical engineering from NITK Suratkal with gold medal and obtained his PhD from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Further, he obtained his postdoctoral degree from the University of California, Riverside, USA. He had served at NITK Suratkal for 28 years in various capacities as professor, HOD, uh, Dean Academics, Dean Planning and Development, POG member, and so on and so forth. Professor Mugeraya has guided 10 PhD and 87 AIMTEC students. He also published 75 research papers in international journals in the area of chemical engineering. He was invited to teach as visiting professor at Asian Institute of Technology, Bangkok, Monash University, Australia, CPSE, Manila, he also served as an advisor to AICT and chairman of Pollution Control Board, Karnataka. Before joining NIT Goa as the director, he had served as the director of NIT, Agar NIT Agartala and also the director of NIT Mizora. He was the chief coordinator of an ambitious project of Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. He was the first one to introduce MTech program in industrial biotechnology in India at NITK. Professor Mugeraya had a special privilege of being one of the technical experts accompanying President of India Pranab Mukherjee during his official tour to China in 2016, wherein the Chinese universities and the Indian universities of national importance signed MOUs. He was invited to attend the BRICS Energy Summit in 2018 at Moscow, presided over by the Russian President, Sir Vladimir Putin. Thank you for being with us on this day. Let me now take the pleasure of introducing our another patron, Professor Uma Maheshwar Rao, the director of NITK Suratkal, who obtained his PhD in the field of rock mechanics from IIT Kharagpur. With a steady growth from lecturer, he became a full professor in 2004. As a professor, Dr. Rao had served IIT Kharagpur at various administrative positions like Chairman Estate and Vice Chairman Joint Entrance Exam. Professor Rao was the head of the Mining Engineering Department from 2006 to 2008 and then from 2010 to 2014. 
Professor Rao's field of special, specialization is experimental rock mechanics, and he has been working in the area since 1989. Six PhD students have received degrees under his supervision, and there are another 12 research scholars in the advanced stage of research under his supervision. He has, to his credit, published 30 quality papers in international journals and 30 papers in the international seminars and conferences. The milestone in his research is the publication of a book on the principles of rock drilling published by A. A. Balkema, Rotterdam, Netherlands in 1999. This book has given Professor Rao an international acclaim in the field of mining engineering. Professor Rao has obtained INSA, KOSCF, Korea Science and Engineering Foundation Award, and under this fellowship program, he worked at Korea Institute of Geoscience and Mineral Resources in 2003 and 4. Later, he was awarded Erudite Fellowship from KIG AM, that's also from South Korea in 2005. And then he was appointed as a visiting professor at the Chonam National University, Guangzhou, South Korea. He served as a professor in the Department of Ren Energy Resources Engineering at CNU during 2008 and 9. During his association with South Korea until 2012, he, has, he was invited on various occasions for delivering lectures in Seoul, National University, Chonam National University, Kangwa National University. He was also invited by the University of Adelaide, Australia for delivering lectures in mining engineering. Later in the year 2015, he was appointed as the visiting professor in the University of British Columbia, Okangan campus by the School of Mechanical Engineering. And when we approached Professor Rao for the seminar, he agreed to be one of the patrons and gave us full freedom to work on it. Thank you, sir, for being with us. May I now request our director, Professor Mugeraya, to address the gathering. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Namaskar. Very good morning to each one of you present here. Uh, respected so the guest of today's function, my good friend, uh, Dr. K. Umameshwar Rauji, with a uh, patron, the keynote speaker of today's function, Professor Yuri Jodi from Tokyo, Japan. Guest speakers, Professor Ranjan Kini from Indian University, Indian, Indian University, USA. Professor Priyanka Tripathi from IIT Patna. G. Ganesh from IM Ranchi. Professor Garima Gala from JNU New Delhi. Professor Muruganathan from NIT Trichy. Professor Ganesh Chaman from BHC Raipur. Professor Mohammed Safi from NIT Calicut. Professor Kibir from VIT Business School. Chennai. My respected colleagues from NIT Goa, NIT Suratkal, participants, my dear students, ladies and gentlemen, and boys and girls. Greetings to each one of you present here on the special occasion of this international conference jointly held by NIT Suratkal and NIT Goa on the topic Sustainable Learning, Strategies, and its Consequences in Digital India. I am delighted and I should congratulate Dr. Sarani and Dr. Sheena for getting such a galaxy of good speakers who are icons in their area to bring them to a single platform to discuss on a topic which has a relevance in the day-to-day -day life which is happening because of pandemic. Congratulations to Dr. Sarani and Sheena. I'm very proud to say that in any technical institutes like IIT or NITs, we will find very international, very less international conferences being held by either humanities, science or other departments. Majority is taken by the technical department. But I always, once for all, I've been always pleading in my private institution also, the departments like physics, chemistry, mathematics, humanities and English should never end as a supporting department. They should grow as an independent department so that along with the institute, that should grow because unless the science humanities grows in the technical institution, the uh, institute becomes incomplete. In that way, I'm very happy. Congratulations for the wonderful initiative you have done. Friends, uh, I'm not a uh, you know, veteran in this topic. You will be hearing from uh, the experts in this domain. However, I share some of my uh, ideas uh, in, in this domain. This pandemic COVID-19 has put the entire humanity into a severe jolt economically, academically, 
emotionally and socially but the life must go on and we have to work so this digitalization has become a blessing in disguise now the topic which you have chosen has five questions to ask the topic is sustainable learning strategies and consequences in digital india my questions to the gathering uh, is that whether it's a blessing in disguise teach technology be a choice replacement or it's a temporary due to this pandemic or in some stage the convention classroom might become redundant in future has to think you have to think on that now next question is what is the response of the stakeholders student staff faculty parents whether they agree for this is just like that one person was a vegetarian for 30 years suddenly he did wanted to become a non vegetarian his mind agrees but the system may not appreciate and absorb so whether the students even they want whether it's effective it's very very important third question is are we ready with the facilities in terms of technology in terms of our competence in terms of connectivity in terms of our com computer literacy because this teaching learning becomes effective when all these points are addressed effectively if we don't do that it becomes obsolete the third thing is the teacher when they shifted from the typical classroom face to face teaching or called the chalk and talk uh, uh, scenario to the uh, the was called as online they should have an assurance level to the stakeholders the teacher has to assure that at the end of the day we will provide this type of education to you so the assurance level to the stakeholders for maintaining the quality security and privacy of the content so these are the things and again last is that we should get the feedback so this the digital learning becomes very effective when you answer all these five questions i am very sure the speakers will uh, throw their light on this uh, very effectively now as a teacher i always feel that uh, in uh, in nati goa uh, there is a slogan called savidhyaya vimuktaye that means the education is something which should bring the students out of the clutches of the life so are we addressing this issue in our curriculum second thing is teaching learning process should be made as a fun it's not a punishment i am talking from the the 10th standard to the the higher level unless you make the teaching learning as, as a passion that's why teaching is not a job it's a profession a job with a passion called as profession so teaching is, i always tell my faculty that it is a profession so the teacher has to take as a challenge and deliver the content effectively <coughs> now moving from the face to face to the uh, the online teaching has a lot of challenges now the three c's are very important i am very fascinated about this uh, letter c in my life three c's are one is the commitment the second is the uh, the uh, uh, the communication the third is the conduct now only these three are very effective this online teaching becomes ineffective but there are lot of technologies i think uh, later prathvi will talk on this on called virtual mode i'm very happy that this time nit goa seven of the laboratories of mechanical department are be conducted by suratkal staff together together seven by virtual mode and so effective and the students are very happy in fact feedback is very good and uh, the initiated by dr gangadharan dr patyu prathvi or kulkarni as well as the uh, dr desai made it so easy for us so that means virtual labs are the future of our uh, system because we can share it very well one of the other thing is that this has given by default an opportunity for nit goa student to interact with the faculty of nit suratkal iit bombay iisc very effectively otherwise they won't have this opportunity so so the, the horizon of teaching learning process has expanded now we are in a position to interact with the, uh, dr yuri jodi from tokyo and kini from indian and usc because of this digitalization so this is the future because less investment more interactive otherwise i have seen uh, uh, it's not out of context i am telling it i used to visit professor rao also knows it to have a one hour meeting in delhi we have to spend two days three hours of flight two hours in the airport then uh, again uh, back and uh, just about two days of routine but in this virtual mode 
we are so effectively within one hour we can now uh, convey all our uh, ideas so virtual meetings are very very effective and that will be the future of uh, in even if you come out of pandemic i am sure that this is going to be the the future of the uh, activities <coughs> now one more thing is that uh, especially i am talking about the, the faculty who are 55 plus and we are not so complete to say we are youngsters now it has given opportunity for us to revisit our capabilities in terms of our literacy in terms of the digitization of our computers and we could find we could find to our capabilities for example i'm a conventional teacher I always used to believe in, uh, uh, in 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 the classroom teaching in fact i used to, i used to oppose uh, what's called as uh, 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 that the projectors also i used to talk and chalk and talk is very effective now it's changed and uh, we can uh, uh, include so many updated in versions through this digitization but i am very sure that this won't be a replacement this cannot be replacement it will be an a, a addition to what exactly what we do it in the uh, future uh, activities now let us uh, uh, give an opportunity why exactly the nit suratkar and nd goa together has formed this because the two pilots lady pilots that sheena and dr sarani has taken up this uh, uh, mission they have to fly and land landing is not the solution you have to take this forward because the any seminar the beginning will start the activity will start at the end of the inaugural at the end of the uh, validity so we should have a good connectivity we should have the capabilities we should have the uh, the uh, competence with each other and also we should have together compatibility okay at the end of the day we should be compatible so that uh, we'll uh, achieve whatever you want this why i always say uh, 1 plus 1 is not 2 1 plus 1 is 11 1 minus 1 is not 0 1 minus 1 is minus 11 okay uh, so consult complement each other's expertise compatible with each other and concern for each other is the importance of c i include almost 10 c's today i'm very sure this will be discussed in your uh, system but uh, not at the last i would say that i always say that teaching is not pumping of information to the brain of the student okay it is a process of making the student to think so don't overload the students with a lot of information you have gathered from the google now that the, the whole era of teaching learning process is changed previously when I, we were the student the teaching learning means that get the job of a teacher to give information now student has enough in information the job of a teacher to synthesize the knowledge from the information they gathered so in the digital era is very important that the teacher whatever the information he collects from different media he has to synthesize the knowledge out of this information and that knowledge has to be imparted to the student and the student can convert this knowledge into money later for his convenience so with these few words i once again congratulate the uh, the two uh, lady pilots dr shina and dr sarini and also my good friend dr uh, uma meshwara for being with me always you are always with me whenever I, I need some help i call him and within a minute he approach so that shows your love and affinity affiliation to us institution like goa because goa is a very infant institution only 10 year old and i'm very happy professor to say share that this convocation we are graduating 12 phd students sir, within a span of 7 years so that's exactly academically we have 84 phd student we have published about 200 uh, publications uh, essay journals this year and we have about 34 crores worth uh, research grant and all our faculty members are involved in all the activities the reason last time we got about 77th rank as in our nif ranking without campus without a campus here including director is staying in a rented house but still i'm very sure that uh, uh, it's uh, uh, the teaching is not the uh, 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 an institution cannot be built by building it's by the faculty students teaching learning process and teacher taught relations with these few words and again thank each one of you present here namaskar jai hind vande mataram Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your words. And you started with a very pertinent question 
that whether the scenario the ongoing scenario is a blessing in disguise so this is what we are actually going to discuss in this two days deliberation uh, thank you sir so may i now request the other patron from the nitk suratkar professor rao to speak a few words on this occasion over to you professor rao uh, thank you ma'am uh, distinguished professor uh, director nitk goa nit goa professor gopal magra and uh, distinguished speakers from across the world and the faculty members of both the institutions nit goa and uh, nitk suratkal and any student member who is uh, attending this one a very good morning to you all uh, from suratkal it gives me immense pleasure to be present here today in this today conference on the sustainable learning strategies and its consequences in digital india and in fact uh, professor gopal mograi has uh, already answered all the questions which he has already put and uh, only thing is i take it forward from there in fact this particular topic the sustainable learning strategies and its consequences in a digital india has opened out many vistas or rather key sentences or key, key phrases one is the digital technology and its influence on teaching and learning second is that the teaching learning assessment and our strategies for sustainable learning this is the second key phrase third is the learning outcomes is what is really i put in quotes learning outcomes is another keyword or key sentence another thing which is there hidden in the theme is that the national education policy 2020 and the other one is that the development of flexible curriculum to address some of the issues and uh, last but not the least is the covid pandemic right just if you just try to summarize the entire these key sentences are key words digital technology has been there around us since 90s and it has really been making some insignificant dent in education as well but then it has not really taken away and then taken forward to make it a significant presence of that one and there are certain key issues which are very very specific to our country uh, whether it is relevant here or not i would like to really share that because they are very pertinent when we are trying to sit here to plan or draw a strategy for a sustainable learning the issues are the key issues which are very specific to our country are the which we have really been discussing a lot in the past webinars across the country that is the gross enrollment ratio i am not reading the statistics about the gross enrollment ratio here all of you know because you are all wise people you know what exactly is our gross enrollment ratio when we say that it is very low it only infers that enrollment is very low by indian youth in education per se and as such as well as the higher education that is a second one and second point is that most of our institutions indian institutions or universities they don't really seen in the top rankings in the global rankings scenario this is another question which we have got to really think very seriously before we plan for uh, drawing the strategies for learning or sustainable learning and our academic curriculum is not in line with the demands of the job market the consequence of that one is that there is a very big gap that has really developed between the needs of the industry and the students who are passing out from the institutions and eventually what has happened is that again statistics statistics are not important for us here but then unemployability i'm not saying the unemployment unemployability or non employability of our indian indian graduates is seen very clearly it's very conspicuous and not to say anything about the engineering graduates and their non employability in industries and very specific to the core industries it is uh, something around uh, about 10 to 15% is the employ employability of our engineering graduates this is another issue which we have got to really 
think i'm not putting questions i'm just only trying to give the the points which we have got to really think before we draw the the learning process and uh, the point is that employment or employability is not a created problem this is a real problem the real problem which directly or indirectly the institutions and the teachers are responsible for that one there is no doubt uh, about that one the reason is that the same graduating students from the indian universities i'm not even uh, referring to the ranking whether you are ranked top or uh, ranked lower irrespective of that one the students from the indian institutions or in universities when they go abroad overseas they are doing really very good they are doing all in flying colors then where is this, the, where where are we going wrong so this is a one question which we have got to put to ourselves means the teaching community okay and then what exactly is happening is that let us just look into uh, what must have been the one of the reasons contributing factors for this one for years we have been following the conventional approach of teaching teaching and learning this is content based content based teacher goes into the class and then students are there in the class and then we are really dumping the students with a lot of information say through blackboard or whatever the way in which whatever the facilities that we have a lot of information is dumped on the students this is one thing and then we have a rigid syllabus two third we have a rigid time also time bound four years means four years and we have the fixed credits this has still been even today it is there even in iits also i am not really making any discrimination here universities or iits or nits right we are in this we got really fixed in that in this particular four walls of what exactly is happening in our current education system we may have to really think very seriously about this one but then what exactly is happening is that in contrast we all know and we are happy that the industry has gone into 4.0 revolution and the outcomes of that we are enjoying and one such reason is that we are now today able to gather online right it is all possible because of the digital technology which has invaded right right from the lowest rung personal to the highest right even our honorable prime ministers everybody is in, uh, using the digital technology and it has invaded us can we ever think of uh, a, a smartphone not available for us today i think we go restless it just builds up in us so no, this is the invasion of digital technology on us then where exactly is going wrong in this era of 4.0 industrial revolution the gap between the needs of the industry and the, the pass outs from the uh, institutions there is the gap is really widening growing year after year year after year so now the strategy for sustainable or the learning in my opinion it should be outcome based uh, teaching and learning right when we say the outcome based teaching and learning the one major take away is that what are the learning outcomes very clearly be defined there is no there should not be any ambiguity in defining what are the learning outcomes at the end of any mining engineering at the end of chemical technology at the end of mechanical engineering program what exactly are the outcomes of this particular program when we go into each of the program right there is a course course outcome should also be there and then when we go into the details of the modules in that one module outcome and objective should also be defined and then when further going dissecting that one distinct or integrating or not rather differentiating that one even the unit should also have a well defined objective and the learning outcome right at the end of this entire program is the student able to apply the knowledge is the student able to identify the problem and then stand in the problem and then offer a solution is the student able to design a solution is the student able to conduct the the uh, the pro process is a student able to create these are the some very well defined learning outcomes have to be there right one aspect which i would like to really bring it to the notice of everyone is that in 2013 the government of india has initiated a program and that program let me just see if i have that one this is all about uh, the developing sustainable right developing sustainable pedagogical methods for various engineering classes 
and research in e learning this was the initiative of the the then minister of uh, higher education human resources mhrd and today it is uh, minister of education this was initiated in the year 2013 what has happened to that particular thing e learning has already initiated in 2013 but then where did we lose in trying to implement that one these are some of the questions which we have got to answer before we draw another plan right there is a lot of thought going into planning the process which has to be sustainable but then before we go into that one we should look back over our shoulders and then we have got to find out what exactly are the requirements how we can really improve the employability of our graduates graduating students how we can make our the teaching learning process more effective what can be the the best way in which we can improve the knowledge skills and ability of our students and then the lastly is that right where did we go wrong when it was drawn by the minister of human resources in 2013 why didn't it really percolate down to every institutions in the country why it was put in a cold storage what was the reason that it could not be implemented one of the reasons is that i don't i'm not really stating that it is the issue with uh, indian uh, institutions it is global because i have seen i have taught in korea i have taught in australia i have taught in uh, canada also right we have a, some sort of uh, uh, acceptance of the new technology is a problem right i am conversant with the conventional method of teaching and then i expect that it is a teacher centric education is what we are comfortable with i teach and then you learn but then what i am teaching is it relevant or not i am not really look, uh, making any analysis about that one right we are really comfortable in our that particular zone of teacher centric teaching but then today we are facing the millennial generation this millennial generation is not really in a mood or a temperament to accept our methodology and then they have the information ladies and gentlemen they have lots of information now available on the the uh, various forms right in the net right and then today there is no exaggeration in stating that if a student says that google guru and then is believing on google guru whether we accept it or not everybody everybody is referring to google right you sit before a doctor for your prescription he is also trying to refer to google and then you you go to a banker he is referring to google you go to a market is referring to google we a teacher is referring to google google is there in us but then are we accepting that information is already available in various forms to the students and then where is the what is the role of the teacher here when the information is there the role of the teacher is to make the student learn not the information uh, they are not sitting in the classroom for the information they have to learn as i said they have got to increase their abilities to analyze the the problems right and then uh, lastly all these questions are answered even the post questions posed by professor kopal magaraya are also answered in our national education policy which was unveiled uh, on 7th of august 2020 since then across the country there were hundreds hundreds of uh, webinars conducted on trying to understand what exactly is uh, this one nep 2020 and then some of the institutions have had series of webinars and trying to really disseminate the information there and then so that every teacher who is a stakeholder for the tomorrow's uh, the engineers or the graduates right so now they were given a chance to understand that one and then made uh, given an opportunity for the teachers to know place himself in that nep 2020 and what is his role right the roles are very clearly defined of a teacher what a teacher has to really do is very well defined in nep 2020 now the total onus the total onus lies on the teachers not on the students it is my uh they take away in this one and then the beginning of the change or systematic change or a gradual change it has to be initiated from the teacher and teacher alone okay so now the success of nep depends on the clarity of planning for implementation and the net ntk we have also taken some initiative and then only yesterday we had a, a marathon meeting with all the stakeholders and then try to understand what exactly are the important issues in the national education policy first thing is that let us come out of the rigid system curriculum should be open ended one and time should be also be say now 
in if you look, look into any uh, north american universities or even for that matter south korea also there is it is a btech program in, is not rigid for four years never what they call is a freshman second is a sophomore after sophomore a student is forced rather for, a student is offered an uh, option to leave the university and work in army or work in any other place and then go out of the country and then hone some more skills and come back and the time given to him is just two years only thing is that he is not expected to sit at home and then enjoy no that in this two years he has to really uh, give to the university what exactly are the additional things which he has really acquired and then when he comes as a, a junior and then when he goes to take the degree that he is a man or a woman right with very clearly having the knowledge of what exactly is his role in nation building we haven't done that we said that it is four years program 160 credits period right and then they say another point which we have the uh, uh, the lacuna which we have in our system is that a student who has failed in mathematics one he can pass even after completing his btech program is it falling in the place of bloom's taxonomy bloom's taxonomy very clearly says states that that nap is totally based on that bloom's taxonomy it clearly states that when unless the student has cleared acquired the lower level knowledge he cannot go on to the higher level knowledge if he is in second year it is presumed that as per this uh, bloom's taxonomy that he has acquired the sufficient knowledge of the elementary level of this whatever the course curriculum or the course requirements are but now imagine the the parity here is that only 50% of the first year credits or first semester credits if he is cleared he is going into the second semester 50% he is going to second year 50% going into the third year 50% is going to the fourth year and then at the end within 16 or 17 backlogs he is sitting at home and then clearing the subjects on what sort of a skills he, skills he has acquired and how can he be employed this is the paradox in our system unless we seriously look into this answering this paradox unless a student has cleared all the subjects of first year he cannot go to the second year unless he clears the subjects of all the second year means semester 1 and semester even and odd semesters he cannot go to higher level that is the third year and so on and so forth right so now here we are in a way trying to answer the option which is available in nep 2020 NEP 2020 it says that can we really think of multiple entry and exit here it is possible how is it possible if a student has cleared first year all subjects are cleared the minimum required 40 credits are cleared maybe he wants to leave so we can give him a certificate after second year he has cleared another 40 credits 80 credits are done so so for more certificate is there third year a diploma is there final year he gets a degree but in the current current system he still has a backlog on his shoulders so now if you have got to realize academic bank of credit if you have got to realize multiple entry and exit if you have got to realize that student has to really acquire the skills required by the industry and if you have got to realize the other objectives of nep 2020 Right. Not only that, right, increasing our employability and making our curriculum flexible, and then allowing a student to acquire some credit courses outside the institution. Say, for example, today it is out of understanding that the teachers from NITK are offering online classes to the students of NIT Goa. Right? This has to be a regular process. What I mean is, it has to be a regular process. sitting in goa a student can register for the course should be having that freedom or the flexibility to register for a course in nit k suratkal why nit k he can have as well uh, 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 the register for a course from university of uh, the berkeley right now it is we have gone come to an era of seamless learning there is no boundary we cannot be rigid in our thoughts and an implementation and drawing the strategies of learning it never it, it can never be sustainable 
let me tell you unless we come out of this particular the the our conservative thoughts make it student centric and students should be given an option maybe you just today even it designed slated for 4 years in 8 years at at nit surat kal i don't know if we really divide that 8 years right first two years let him take 4 years third and fourth year let him take 4 years that right? he wants to quit after second year okay jali good he go he can go but then he may he may be given a diploma because he has cleared all the subjects of 80 credits by the end of second year and then if he wants to terminate his education for whatever the reasons personal reasons right he is easy to go there so these options we have got to think out of the margin think out of the the book only then we will be able to come out with a student centric the the uh, 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 teaching learning and we will be able to do some contribution to the country to grow uh, higher okay lastly i would just like to uh, answer professor gopal magra please don't mind online is going to be there sir this no way even today right today i don't i i am not saying that the covid uh, pandemic has uh, been a, a blessing which you have asked me it is never a blessing but then it has put us in a a, a particular predicament that only some leaders have really born out of this particular crisis and they are now leading from the front one such leader is i would say the digital technology inanimate thing but then the leader for this pandemic is digital technology now life has gone online sitting at home even on a, a simple smartphone i am able to go around the globe i am able to market i am able to watch the movie i am able to talk to my son i am able to conduct the classes i am able to have the meetings what are the other activities that we are really doing so now the hero which is identified and who is contributing in this pandemic area and the blessing here is that digital technology had pandemic not been there around us what would have happened in fact that has changed the circumstances the same plight what has happened to the government of india's ministry of education that is mhrd's initiative of e learning in 2013 whatever has happened to that it was only created a thick volume of 1066 pages of e learning is completed project is closed and it is frozen in the cold storage it does not really disseminate into any institution pandemic has created a new circumstance pandemic has made us to realize what are what are our inadequacies pandemic has created us to take an initiative because if you don't do it we are doomed to be lost survival is the fittest is the old adage which pandemic has only brought in us right it hasn't given a, a teacher to go on a debate why should i conduct online classes it hasn't given that there is no option for a teacher to go on a debate today you like it you don't like it you have got to take the classes online period right so now you are able to students are able to monitor the quality of teaching also right so now online is going to be there only question is that the conventional classroom teaching will also be there only thing is what exactly is the percentage of online classes and then the offline classes it's in a flipped mode that we are going to have in future and we have got to be prepared let us all the teachers here across the globe let us all honor the intellect of the students we should not really sit here to dump the information on the students and then increase their memory quotient right today a smartphone is enough to really keep all in its the memory right we are not really expected uh, we are not expecting our students to become only a unsmart uh, persons only containing lot of information which cannot be applied an electrical engineer if he is not able to identify what exactly is the problem in his the tube light right can you just imagine a doctor who cannot really feel the pulse can we really expect can we accept him as a doctor we cannot but then the same question we have got to put to ourselves can our engineers stand in the problem and then offer a solution 
and that is where this particular topic of the the strategy and the sustainable learning what is sustainable is outcome based education which is student centric out of the rigid boundaries flexible is going to be only flexible in the 21st century for the millennial generation and we can draw the satisfaction in when our students are really flying going in flying colors that is the satisfaction a teacher has thank you for very much for giving me this opportunity and uh, right i haven't really made anybody i didn't want to really hurt anybody's uh, intentions or the the feelings but then mm. let us let us think the facts the facts okay. are before us if my students are not able to find in a job it is the fault of the institution and the fault of the teacher not the student this is the one thing which we have got to realize and then move forward thank you very much have a good day and thank professor gopal mogar and others for giving me this opportunity to share my feelings from the bottom of my heart because we teachers we have got to do it's a time for us we are at the crossroads it's a time for us to bring the change and covid is here is a blessing in this guys because whatever the changes that you want to bring in bring in the changes right covid will protect you from that one definitely thank you sir dr sarani a minute dr sarani yes sir yeah dr uh, uh, rao thank you very much for wonderful speech and you are really complimented the ideas we uh, we had started a uh, couple of points one is uh, in indian scenario there is a word called inertia inertia is the resistance to change that is pretty high there is a reason it takes some time for the digitization second thing is that uh, computer should become our slave but we should not become slave to computers because we a, a stage should not come that without digitization we can't teach uh, i was uh, you know mentioning this in previous talk that uh, when the powerpoint presentation came over here some of the faculty members they couldn't take class without powerpoint so there is a saying that power corrupts a politician powerpoint corrects a teacher so it should not come to that stage the last one is the blessing is that uh as you know uh, because of digitization the parents have become partners now so teachers should become teammate thank you thank you professor rao for highlighting the key aspects of digitalization and you have aptly pointed out that education is a process of learning unlearning and relearning so we are now in a state of unlearning and relearning to be at par with the uh, parameters imposed on us by digital india and you have also mentioned the sustainable outcomes yes we will also discuss this outcome based education policies in our two days deliberation because out sustainable outcomes can only make us ready for the challenges of the future and also flipped classroom is one of the solutions you have already mentioned so let us see what are the speakers in the two days deliberation talk about all these issues now with this uh, thank you very much sir now with this now i would like to introduce our keynote speaker professor jodi yujobo she is a japanese american born and raised and educated in the us then four years spent in sydney and finally she moved to tokyo about 18 years ago She has been working as an associate professor in the Center for English as a Lingua Franca at Tamagawa University, Tokyo, since 2013. She is an academic coordinator for 150 classes, which include about 2,200 students. Her specialization is ELF, that is English as Lingua Franca. As a researcher, she has been presenting papers on ELF extensively. She is the recipient of three grants in aid for scientific research, Japan Society for Promotion of Science, and it is also called MEXT, M-E-X-T, which is a fellowship for excellence in research. So the areas of her research, namely the first one, developing resources for teaching and assessing communication strategies in ELF informed pedagogy, an empirical approach based on learners' communicative competence. The second one is development of Japanese English simultaneous and late successive bilingual discourse skills, narrative study on international baccalaureate. 
And the third one is study of cross-linguistic influences in simultaneous bilingual narratives of teenagers. She's also the global human resource development trainer, Fuji Xerox Learning Institute, Tokyo. She provides intercultural training and conducts pre-departure seminars for employees assigned to overseas assignments. She has also developed a corporate philanthropy global service learning program for corporate executives. Her research interest includes 21st century skills, active learning, global HRD, global citizenship, ELF, communicative strategies, and project and problem-based interdisciplinary learning. Here, I would like to mention that the Indian and the Japanese situation are almost similar because English is not the native language in these two countries. And like Japan, we are bilingual, and sometimes we are trilingual or multilingual. So therefore, let us know from her how they are coping the challenges of teaching language online in the COVID and in the post-COVID, which may be useful for us, and also for the management. So communicative English is a necessity as it is the global lingua franca and Jodi has been working also as a trainer in that field for over a decade. So over to you, Jodi. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sarani. Thank you. I'd like to share my slides first here and make sure. Okay. Are you able to see my slides? Yes, yes, please go okay. ahead, Professor. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, let me go back to my friend. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to the National Institute of Technology for inviting me for the keynote speech today. Um, I'm very humbled and honored to speak to you all today. Um, we are all in the midst of a terrible global pandemic, and I'm hoping that each day will bring better news as the, day, as the previous day. Um, until then, we just need to hang in there as teachers and support each other as an international community of teachers battling this big force, um, trying to really prevail through what we, we can do and what we do know that works. I hope this weekend highlights the, our human strengths um, as we try to reclaim our calmness and bring in the normalcy to our daily lives. And we're able to learn and hear and discuss um, from others about this issue. Um, with this said, my topic today will be reconnecting with Zenjin, which means whole person principles and sustainable learning strategies for developing the next human resource, the global human resources during the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, I will skip my introduction there. Okay. So first of all, um, this is my outline for my keynote speech today. I will have five main points and I will be going through each of these um, one by one. So first of all, let's start with the first one. The background of Tamagawa Academy and University. So this is the university that I am teaching at at the moment. And when you think of Tokyo, many of you think about these skyscrapers and being in this area of lots of neon lights. Um, that area of Tokyo is actually in this red area that's mentioned here in this map. Um, all of Tokyo includes this green area as well. So the green and the red area together equals Tokyo. Um, my university is actually on the outskirts of this red area in this area called Machida City. And it's in the outskirts because it's actually not anything like the city of Tokyo. Our tallest building is maybe seven stories and we do not have neon lights. We have lots of trees. We have lots of uh, wildlife as well. So Tamagawa Academy started off as an ele elementary school in 1929 and later established the university in 1947. As you can see here from this picture, our campus is quite large for being a metropolitan area. Uh, we have 150 acres, which is 612,000 square meters. And we also house kindergarten through 16 grades. So from kindergarten all the way to university are all on one campus. This might not be something familiar in India. It's quite common in some Japanese private universities and uh, elementary schools through universities um, in this situation here. And we have a K through 12 program with 1900 students. 
And uh, we have two tracks in this um, K through 12 program. And I will be explaining this a lot in detail because um, the reason is we have two main tracks. One is all in Japanese, which means from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade of high school, they will be spending all of their subjects in Japanese language. And then we have another track at the same school in a different classroom that's doing the all English program. And this is based on the International Baccalaureate, MYP and DP program. And where I work is the university, which has eight colleges with about 7,400 students. These are the eight um, departments that we have, business administration, humanities, arts and science, which is liberal arts, um, arts, tourism and hospitality, agriculture, engineering and education. And where I work is called Center for English as a Lingua Franca. We call it SELF and it provides English to all of the eight colleges. Okay, so the Center for English as a Lingua Franca um, is our focus. And English as a Lingua Franca is a little bit different than um, EFL, which is English as a foreign language. Our ELF program is using, is sorry, is focusing on the use of English among speakers of different first languages for whom English is a communicative medium of choice and often the only um, option. Um, learning objective references we have is what people actually do with the language that they have learned, how they communicate in English as an additional language. And this is given by our um, main person in ELF uh, research, um, Barbara Seidelhofer, and also by CORE saying, uh, rather than setting the native competence as a target, we should be able to do what we can as Japanese learners. Um, by taking away what native speakers are doing, then our Japanese learners don't have to really reach as high as um, trying to become just like a native speaker. That's impossible through our program here in Japan. So why not take away that um, native speaker competence and really focus on the message and communication itself? And the three main points I want to highlight today about our English as a Lingua Franca program is that it's the interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, earlier we talked about, uh, we heard about um, universities kind of being very independent and there's not very much collaboration between the sciences and the arts. Um, that's exactly the problem here in Japan as well. We do not have any interdisciplinary um, ties with other departments except through English. And this is our chance to use English as the kind of the wave, the wave to bring in interdisciplinary inter, um, collaboration. And also we have small classes and active learning facilities. In Japan, that's quite um, not, not familiar in many schools. We have large classrooms, lots of lecture style classrooms where the teacher sits, stands in the front and just teaches English lessons uh, all day and students are very um, in, inactive in this classroom, but our classrooms are very small. We have active learning going on where the students have to interact with each other in groups. And that's one of our main um, areas that we were focusing on. And another area for English as Lingua Franca is we hire native speaking teachers, but also many, many non-native speaking teachers. We actually see that non-native speaker speaking teachers from all over the country brings in a wealth of culture and experience and a lot of different um, varieties of English. And then by our students looking at these, the uh, English Lingua Franca teachers as a model of English communication. So there's no standard English. We do not need to find the standard English. We just need to be able to know that English is used as a communication. And as of now, we have four, 19 different countries represented in our teaching staff and 14 mother tongues. And in the 2019 plenary um, in Asia TEFL, um, Andy Kirkpatrick said, ELF speakers make good ELF teachers because they have empathy, uh, they have their good linguistic models, they facilitate intercultural competence, bilingual pedagogy, and they promote multilingual ethos. Okay. And as I said, our campus is quite large. So I just wanted to share some photos of our four seasons. This is all on campus. So as you can see, as we move through the seasons, our campus completely changes in color. Okay. So earlier I mentioned uh, we have two tracks and 
this is the track where we're the three, we start from kindergarten time through 12th grade in Japanese language. Of course, English is a subject, but it's not the mainstream language that's being used for the subjects. And then we have the international track, which switches to English from about first grade. We actually have an international kindergarten class at five years old, um, but the three and four year olds, they need to develop their first language. And then we have a BLESS program, which is a bilingual program, which kind of brings in English little by little. And by the time they're in fifth grade, um, everything switches to English. And that prepares them to go into the IB MYP program, which is uh, the International Baccalaureate program. And that will be in all in English. All subjects are in English. And then that would bring them to the IB DP program in grades 11th through 12th. And these are where our students try to um, aim for uh, top universities abroad, top universities in Japan. Our mainstream program, uh, about 30% uh, actually go straight into Tamagawa University. Um, several go to other universities as well as aiming for top universities. But our goal is not the universities. It's not being uh, ranked number one. Our goal is for our students to be successful global citizens as ELF communicators. So all, all students from all tracks, our goal is to become successful global citizens as ELF communicators. I'm going to go into another area, which is the problems of traditional silo subject based teaching. Um, this is more about what we were talking about earlier in, in the um, presentations earlier about the teacher centered um, area where it needs to change to more uh, student centered. So in Japan, oh gosh, okay, this is going a little too faster than I expected uh, this minute. Sorry. Just by hand. Okay, so. Um, in Japan, we have the elementary school program here. I can't pause this. Sorry, I cannot pause my... Okay, so... Okay. Oh, it's not going to stop. Okay, sorry. I want to stop this, but I'm unable to. So by looking at this picture, the very bottom part is K through 12, okay? And then in 12th grade, they have to decide two tracks, either arts and science or hard sciences. They cannot mix both. And once they're in one area, they have to stay in that area because all of our university departments are silos, okay? And there's no cross between arts and sciences. That's what we were talking about earlier about um, not having multidiscipline blooms in Japan. And also you're mentioning that and also in India. Um, so once you enter the hard sciences, you stay in this hard sciences all the way up. And if you're, in the, if you choose the social sciences, you'll stay in the social sciences and stay in that silo. Um, English is the only one that is actually interdisciplinary. It can move around back and forth and actually um, cover other um, departments and interwoven um, and have the students actually communicate with each other. Okay, sorry, I, my PowerPoint is not working. Uh, okay, so um, ELF here is woven multidisciplinary approach of multilingual communication and it's the path to global citizens. And through using English as the, the thread to kind of interweave all of these different disciplines is where our focus is right now. For example, this is the silos that exist. What we want to do is we want to eradicate the walls between these silos. We want to have students learning with each other, learning from each other, and teachers also collaborating with other teachers from other departments. This doesn't seem to happen quite well because the, every teacher has their own area of expertise and they're not sharing their expertise with other departments as well. So for this to happen will take lots of time, but little by little, our aim is for English to be that um, kind of the projector to change this um, across Japan. So we are doing some multiple multidisciplinary movement among the students right now. The WSLR is uh, writing, speaking, listening, and reading. Okay, so problem one, as I had mentioned, is the teacher-centered silo. The silo educations lead to lecture-based lessons, and the teachers are known as experts of their field. Um, these are 
based on uh, education from junior high onwards. So junior high, high school, university, it's very one, one teacher based. It's just very teacher centered. The students take notes. Um, the tests are based on memorization of what they were taught by their teacher. And of course, as you know, this kind of learning um, is the lowest type of retainment of information. And 5% of information through lectures are retained only. Um, if they were to collaborate with each other, learn from each other, they would have a larger percentage of being uh, the information being retained. And this is the problem. Um, and of course, the um, Ministry of Education has also realized that a lot of people are focusing only on the exams. Um, the they have started to revise the exams, but the 2021 was also the start of the COVID situation where the, the first rollout of the new exams happened during COVID. So uh, a lot of the um, teachers were not ready. A lot of the students were not ready. So maybe next year or the year after, uh, little by little, this um, new revision will start um, taking place and we'll know more about this. But they're trying to let students focus more on um, writing and also understanding of the um, question, not just is it A, B, or C, or D. Instead of a multiple choice, they have to actually write their reasons. And next is also proposing this as an interactivity for elementary school through high school. Elementary school as of now has a little bit of active learning because they really feel that um, learning from each other, meeting other, other students is very um, important for elementary school students. So they are doing some interactivity, but they are going to focus more um, on this. Okay, so another problem here um, is based on the OECD database. And this database shows that um, teachers lack preparedness for ICT-based teaching. And here, um, teachers who report that they frequently or always let students use ICT projects for classwork. Um, Japan actually ranked the lowest out of the OECD countries that were on this, um, in this uh, table. And teachers um, for whom they, whom uh, use ICT for teaching was included in their formal education training. Well, that's quite high. We, we do have uh, training um, programs for ICT development and also for teachers to be able to use ICT. Um, it's formal part of their training. However, um, as you see here, they frequently let, actually used it in their classrooms. And teachers who feel that they can support students learning through the use of digital technology um, was very low, actually the lowest again here. So this is all post, uh, this is all, sorry, pre-COVID in 2018. And then teachers for whom ICT skills for teaching were included in the professional development activities were only 53%. And then teachers reporting a high level for need for professional development ICT skills was the highest. So that means that they are unprepared. Uh, this was prior to COVID, but once COVID started, the teachers were still in the same situation and all of a sudden they had to switch to online classes. So um, from the lecture style teacher-centered classrooms, all of a sudden they were required to teach online. Um, what had happened was a disaster. Um, so students also, um, because they've spent through from first grade all the way through 12th grade listening to the teacher, once they arrive to the university, they have this understanding that the teacher gives all the information. So there's no attitude towards self-directed learning. And again, here, this is prior to COVID, students who agree or strongly agree that their belief in themselves gets them through hard times was the lowest of all the OECD countries. And they usually manage one way or another. Um, so they, they agree that they can manage was also the lowest, um, but trying hard in school is important to them, which was one of the highest and however, um, contrary to that, their goal in school is to learn as much as possible was the lowest. So what does this mean? Okay, it means that there's low confidence, there's low emotional intelligence, there's low self-autonomy, low flexibility, low ability to adapt to changes, um, learn only test items and they overemphasize on the Hensachi, which is the standard deviation ranking. So they want to get into the top schools because the top schools equals a uh, top um, job um, and then they'll have a stable life. So it's still based on this emphasis on the top school rankings. 
Um, and then limited connection to applying knowledge versus rote memorization and not risk takers. So they're memorizing for the test. They're memorizing for the junior high test entrance exam. They're studying for the high school entrance exam. They're studying for the university entrance exam only. So the, the thought of self-directing learning is basically studying for the test only. So from this situation, the problem is that happened here from junior high all the way through high school is that the delivery method was lecture style. Okay, so this is pre-pandemic. Students' knowledge, uh, they were taking notes because they knew that it was going to be tested on. So that's where they focused on. But we also have a very big cram school system in Japan where students go to cram school after school and they have their knowledge reinforced by their cram school teachers. So here, even if they do not understand or they do not pay attention in class, they can still be reinforced at, at this juku and they can still pass. Okay, so the result is problem with students' attitudes towards self-directed learning, low level of interactivity, students need supplementary support from their uh, private cram, cram schools. And then the pandemic happened and then the same situation where it was just a different mode, it, the teacher would happen to do the lecture online, the student just happened to be sitting in front of a computer instead of in a classroom. Still, the problem was the students did not quite understand what was going to be tested on. They didn't really have motivation to understand information. Worse off, the jukus were closed because of COVID. They were not able to go to the cram schools to get the reinforcement of education. And a lot of people are failing because of this. And uh, the knowledge for the receiver, the problem is the student's attitudes towards self-directed learning, but also it's on the teacher's side as well. The teachers are not tra trained properly in ICT and low level of that interactivity is causing the major problem. So there's no interactivity between the teacher and the student. The knowledge that's required beyond um, testing is not being um, shared. And also through on-demand asynchronous classes, uh, we see teachers have, have learned to use the video tools and they're able to upload their videos um, and do it on, uh, on asynchronous classes. However, the problem is the student's motivation. Uh, they're very low, especially if it's asynchronous, there's no time restraint, so they do not have to show up at a certain time. And it really gives students a hard time to, um, to really judge their own um, ability. And a lot of people give up and uh, the student receiver here, it really depends on the student itself. How well are they motivated to stay up with the information? Um, are they good with time management or not? So this is problems with student attitudes towards more um, demotivating factors, um, higher stress levels and mental stress due to the absence of interactivity. And again, there's no interactivity between students as well. And the first year students start restart in, in April and the pandemic started in March in Japan. So the very first day of class was online. So they never met anyone in their university. They have no emails of any of their student, of the, any of their um, classmates um, they can only email their teacher. So there was no um, interaction at all. Okay, then I'm going to go to the next area. So what can we learn from this? Um, I decided to go back to the main area where we should really be focusing on is Zen Gene, which is the whole person and the 12 precepts. Um, this is talking more about the philosophy of education of the self. And then the intercultural baccalaureate program, sorry, international baccalaureate program, what can we learn from the lower learner profile? And what can we learn from project-based learning and 21st century skills? Okay, so Zen Jean, this is um, based on our um, founder, Kuniyoshi Obara. He was the founder of Tamagawa Academy, and he's also known, a well-known international um, education philosopher, and he coined this word Zen Jean in 1921. Um, Zen means whole and Jean means person. And this is our university at the moment, uh, before we, we didn't have this building, but this original um, sign at the, very big, at the very front of our university has always been there before um, our, old, our new building has been erected. And it says here, be the first to take charge of the most unpleasant and bitterest, the hardest and the most difficult and unprofitable work in life and do it with a smile. So his philosophy is really to push yourself, push yourself to the limits. 
be able to overcome, be able to know yourself that you have the strength to overcome anything. And during this pandemic, this really helps to understand um, where your, you yourself has to be as a learner and you yourself as a teacher. How, how do we overcome the situation? So I decided to bring in the Zenjin um, to, in today's presentation. Um, here again, so Zenjin is a true form of education and it should be concerned with each individual's whole personality and therefore Zenjin is a well-rounded person or well-rounded education that must play the core role in the education system. Um, there's six values, truth, goodness, beauty, holiness, soundness, and wealth. Okay, and then there's 12 Zenjin precepts as well. Um, Zenjin is a whole person, respect individuality, self-study, which is autonomy, highly efficient education, education is scholarship based on science, respect for nature, um, trust, Rosaku, which is community service, uniting opposite sides, independent minded pioneers, so to, to try something new and to take risks, a 24 education, 24 hour education, okay, and global education. Okay, and this is actually quite similar to the IB learner profile. So that's why actually the IB program fits so well with Tamagawa University and or sorry, Tamagawa Academy is because the Senjin principles and the IB learner principles are quite similar, that they focus on the whole child, focusing on intellectual, personal, emotional, and social growth, and to develop international mindedness. Um, we're not focusing only on um, the hensachi, which I was talking about earlier, which is the um, standard deviation and the ranking of the school. We're not only focusing on ranking, we're focusing on the human qualities. And IBO's website also mentions that IBO education is holistic in nature that is concerned with the whole person. And alongside with cognitive development, the IB programs address students' social, emotional, and physical well-being. And Japan also noticed that IB has these skills that they wanted to have in their students all these years, but because they have focused so much on the testing situation, we kind of lost touch with this area. So recently, MEX responded to globalization needs and to develop a wide range of culture, um, including, so they see that IB includes um, foreign language skills, the ability to, to find and solve problems, logical thinking skills, communication skills, knowledge of Jap Japanese modern history. So these are the areas that MEXT, which is the Ministry of Education, has really wanted to focus on and is trying to now um, turn lots of uh, regular high schools into IB schools in Japan. So there's this big movement towards IB schools. And these are the learner attributes of IB on the right side here. And these are also areas that I think that are very necessary for COVID um, to be able for our students to really think, to become thinkers, to become inquirers, to become knowledgeable, um, communicators, principled, caring, balanced, open-minded, risk takers, and reflective. Okay. And of course, project-based learning is the way, is the method of how we are able to do this. And what we would do in our classes are um, give open-ended driving questions and inquiry, have them to really focus on finding an answer that doesn't exist. Um, they have to use their thinking skills. They have to use their creativity. That requires all 21st century skills, um, their student and voice feedback and revision. And also um, Buck Institute of Education, who is the company or the organization in the United States that focuses on project-based learning training, uh, they wrote on their website that they that the teachers need to lead with compassion and care, be mindful of stressors, and provide voice and choice, especially during COVID. And 21st century skills, um, this has always been here for the past 10 years. Uh, we've heard about these the four C's in this case, um, critical thinking, cr uh, creative thinking, communication and collaboration. There's other skills such as critical literacy, digital literacy, um, information media technology skills. And of course, now because of COVID, the most important we see is digital literacy and also socio-emotional skills. This is self-awareness, self-management skills, social awareness, relationship building and responsible decision making. So these are the areas of 21st century skills that are starting to expand more than the four C's. Um, the sustainable skills that it's needed to develop uh, future global leaders. Of course, we have all of these issues all over uh, the world. And these are very um, uh, pressing issues that we as students, our students need to be um, thinking about all the time. 
Um, but also our students not only need to think about these issues, they also need to find a job. And we know that in 2030, the initiative towards AI, the, AI, the um, artificial intelligence generation, uh, Japan says that 49% of the, rock, the work population can be replaced by artificial intelligence and robots. And also um, there's a shortage of um, IT engineers and advanced in IT engineering society. And that's a move away from the digital society. And now humans will require imagination to change the world and creatively materialize their ideas. So going towards the even the 22nd century, um, just to move forward from the 21st century skills, um, there's some sustainable learning skills that we need to really refocus on. And these are the soft skills for global um, human resource development. So pre-pandemic, during pandemic, and then post-pandemic. Um, and then again, going into STEAM, STEM, and esteem. So in 2015, there was this um, article that I found from the Nomura um, Sogo Kenkyujo, and they're talking about the, same, the skills that are needed for um, preparing these, our, uh, the workforce for Society 5.0, because digital technologies and data should be um, utilized to create a society where people lead diverse lifestyles. Okay, and then so these are the top 10, um, the skills that they f at that time felt were the most important to have. And so universities started to look at these saying, oh, well, we don't do this. Uh, we do need to start giving some more um, critical thinking and some negotiation skills. It kind of started a, a, a trend in 2015 about active learning um, and project-based learning kind of started, but it didn't really take off. Um, and it still, still ended up becoming very um, teacher-centered. But then 2020 pre-pandemic, um, there was another um, list that came out saying that critical thinking skills is now necessary. Without critical thinking, um, the, the businesses do not want uh, college graduates. Uh, without creativity, uh, they're unable to use college graduates because they don't have the creative mindset and to, to be able to think of um, outside the box. Um, the managing skills, the conflict management skills, and then, of course, here in 2020, um, emotional intelligence came up near the bottom still, but thinking about um, EI and how students need to really be able to have social um, ability and with themselves and with others. Um, de Decision-making skills and then flexibility skills was quite low at that time before the pandemic. Um, this changed, of course, um, in 2020, during the pandemic, at the end of 2020, um, emotional intelligence became number one. Uh, flexibility and adaptability uh, raised quite high. Leadership came out as a new one. Mental and health management came up. Um, complex problem solving and data literacy. Um, creativity went down a little bit, but it's still in the top 10. Uh, critical and contextual thinking, so it's adding critical thinking with the context of, the, of all the um, information that's on the websites now. We're in a digital era, era where we have to be able to process and analyze and uh, synthesize all the information. Um, also contextual thinking, meaning from the past, what can we learn from the past and what, how are we going to move forward from the past information. Um, interpersonal skills and relationships, empathy and resilience and digital and data processing skills. Um, here in post-pandemic prediction, this is my list. This was not actually on the website, but I also believe that emotional intelligence will still stay at the very, very high area. Um, complex problem solving skills will still be up there. Interpersonal skills, empathy, resilience. It's really hard to rank them. I think all of them are just as important. So I can't really say one is better, is more necessary than the other. I think all 10 are up there quite um, a number one. Okay, um, so our goal here now is to really work together, seek, seek research and discuss the wicked problems and solutions, um, be more proactive and self-directed learners in, in the university area, um, really think about these wicked problems and seek to find and develop creative solutions together. And this would actually equal what a global leader is um, and what a Zenjin person would be. Um, I'm going to skip over STEM and STEAM because I know um, India, of course, is the forefront of STEM education. It's actually quite new in Japan still. So I um, was going to talk about how we're behind in STEM education um, and we're still in silos. Um, we're still not really um, mixing 
the disciplines at all. And little by little, we are starting to. And of course, STEM has come up as another area that's necessary. Um, oh gosh, okay, sorry. And also with STEM, going into STEAM with the arts, we need collaboration with the arts. And then like, as I said earlier, E being added to that is ELF. And then we'll be able to really focus on eradicating all the silos through English as a lingua franca. Uh, these are the wicked problems I was talking about earlier. The pre-pandemic topics were basically on UN SDGs. We're talking about everyone wants to talk about clean energy, um, economic disparity issues, environmental issues, um, solar power, insects for food source, biotechnology food. These are the topics that every department should be focusing on um, from different by, by having students approach this topic from their department brings in new ideas. You can bring in um, tourism for uh, the topic on biotechnology food, for example. It's a very new area for tourism students to talk about that, as it would be very simple for agriculture environmental students to talk about it. But then you talk, for, talk about it from an environmental approach, or sorry, educational approach, um, from a business approach, from science and technology approach, from arts and design approach. All of these students working together in the same classroom talking about these topics is really what the interdisciplinary focus is all about. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to just say um, we are focusing on interdisciplinary. Hopefully, this is the, the forefront. This is the area that we're all focusing on. Pre-pandemic, we started doing this. We did this um, in our building where we had our active classrooms, active learning classrooms, and now we're moving into this esteem area where we're also adding 21st century skills with ELF-informed communication strategies. Um, the student interactivity here is uh, the student are ELF informed knowledge producers, the teacher are no longer just teachers, they're actually um, ELF informed interactive learning designers and they're facilitators. They're not teaching us the, the knowledge, the students themselves are creating the questions and they're creating, they're finding, they're finding the answers. Um, this is the new um, global type of ideas and local. Um, just some some photos. Okay. Um, so these are some photos of our active learning. This is pre-pandemic. They would be working together in a classroom like this, um, where they would be in groups. They would do presentations. So all of our classrooms are very interactive. Uh, there's no classroom that's not interactive. Uh, one student cannot be left behind because they're all part of a group. And they do a lot of um, talking on these topics that we mentioned earlier. This just happened to be creating a sustainable hotel um, on an island. And uh, there's four different groups, environmentalists, hotel developers, tourists, tourism industry, and then local residents. And then they had to first start off in their own groups and find out what kind of hotel that their group would want. But then later on, we divided them up, um, having one environmentalist, one hotel developer, one tourism industry, industry person, and one local resident in a group. So we changed it through um, the jigsaw puzzle type um, uh, division. And we were able to do this actually, the same project through Zoom. So this, I did this this semester. We're able to use Zoom and you're able to use technology quite well. And as long as the teacher is willing to put the effort into this, it's, it worked real, very well. The students broke up into breakout sessions. We had the environmentalist rooms, the hotel developer rooms, the tourism rooms, and the local residents. They spent lots of time uh, talking about it, their um, hotel plan from their perspective, and they did a flip grid on um, on this. So they recorded their voice, they taught, did a little presentation on this. And then we divided, then we changed. After a couple of days, we changed the groupings. And now it's going to be this way, where you can see um, in this chart here, now there's uh, representatives from each area in each group. And then they had to come up with a new hotel idea. And all, all of these, all of them had to negotiate um, to find the middle point their breaking point, what they would accept as an environmentalist. Would they allow an airport on the island, even though it causes um, lots of problems for environmental issues? They had to really decide um, and, and think about the, the pros and cons. And then if they agree with it, then that uh, would be part of their proposal. If they don't agree with it, they would not take that um, in their proposal. So they really worked hard uh, working on this. They did a presentation. Um, each group did a presentation on Zoom. 
And this is the flip grid that they did. Um, they each did a flip grid on their locals, um, hotel developers, environmentalists, and uh, the project itself. Okay, so this is a really a one way for teachers to really let the students do uh, their thinking, to really elicit their communication skills, their collaboration skills, their creativity, and their critical thinking. So all of the 21st century skills are packed into this project. Um, now, because of the post-pandemic, these topics are starting to shift a little bit more. Now we can bring in some other topics, <clears throat> such as um, Asian discrimination due to COVID-19, um, international travel restrictions, uh, Black Lives Matter and racism, environmental intersectionalism, uh, the, the um, disparities in, um, in economic disparities in health issues, as well as the Tokyo Olympics, which uh, is supposedly going on um, soon, and mental health crisis and vaccinations. So these are some areas that other departments can come together and really discuss from their department stance. <clears throat> so putting it all together, Okay, so putting it all together, this is the formula to success um, for global citizens as human as ELF communicators. I feel that having the uh, IB learner profile attributes, um, the Zen gene person, per, the whole person attributes, the 21st century deep, deep learning skills and project based learning, um, the leadership skills and all of the skills that are needed by global human resources. And uh, the way it's being used, the way the classroom is transformed by becoming interdisciplinary and using English as a lingua franca as the base to really weave um, different departments together on these wicked topics is the way that I feel is the kind of the um, formula to successful global citizens. Okay, and then on our wall in our building, we have this quote that I just wanted to share with you. It's real proficiency is when you are able to take possession of the language, turn it to your advantage and make it real for you. This is by Henry G. Widowson, and he is one of our mentors of our program when he started the ELF program. And I really feel that this um, kind of brings it all just straight, straight forward. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you, Professor Jody, for your comprehensive presentation. You have touched upon all the issues and also the concluding note from Henry Widowson, because we are all applied linguists, because we use the language and it is uh, for us, it's a daily, uh, daily application. And uh, a few takeaway points from your presentation. I think which would be useful for us that you mentioned that the speakers of English from different countries may be invited to interact in the language class. So that will make the students exposed to different types of English language because in Australia it's Australian English, in America in American English. So that diversity will be there and this is a uh, this is an idea which we can uh, experiment in our classrooms. And the second point that you mentioned, uh, sustainable learning values. So I think in the next semester, uh, seminar with Sheena, we can think of something on sustainable learning values because we uh, narrowed down our focus on teaching and learning, but we uh, excluded this point that sustainable learning values, which is a necessity in the post pandemic days. Uh, thank you very much. And then 5.0 that I have to uh, do a, I mean, we have to do a research on it that 5.0 skills, which is a futuristic skill. And of course, yes, you have rightly mentioned that self study and self autonomy should be the key word for 22nd century. So thanks a lot for being with us. Now the floor is open for question. Okay. Sir, any madam? Yes, sir. Yeah, and uh, very nice, uh, um, Professor uh, Jody. It was very nice presentation. It was very nice. Uh, have, have your coffee. I think uh, you need a coffee now. Uh, I'm coffee okay. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. See, yes. you had your formal education in the US. Okay. Yes. Later, you moved to Australia. 
Yes. Then I uh, working in Japan. Yes. Actually, it is found that in the Western world, in uh, UK and US, the first language of communication is English. But if you see the Asian countries or South Asian countries, it's a second language. What we speak is our uh, regional languages. Yes. Now, do you feel as a professor, uh, really this language is a hurdle or a barrier for technical interactions? For the reason I'm asking is, if you see that I was in Korea, I was in uh, Thailand, I was in uh, CPC Manila. I found that the Taiwan, if you see, their language may not be good, but Japan, but the technical advances are fantastic. Do you really feel the language is the ultimate barrier of this, uh, uh, the technology transfer or any other issues? Mm, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I'm not based on technology, so I'm not quite sure about um, how people are able to find jobs in Japan from from university. But my perception is English is a barrier only because it's a mindset. They feel that they need to be able to speak in a um, the same as a, as a um, native speaker. So this the way that they've been taught English has really kind of given them the discouragement to be able to speak. But in terms of technology, they have the understanding of, of the technology in their Japanese first language. And it's just a, a, an ability to be able to transfer that into the second language. So I don't know if it's a, if it's a, um, a burden or if it's, a, if it's actually not helping them, but I, I believe that um, Japanese students really need to, first of all, believe in themselves. Really, they need to really have that confidence. Good, very nice. So, any other questions from the participants? I don't have a question, but I have a request. I want uh, Professor Jody to come to our place, go and be our guest sometime. Okay. <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> Thank you very much. I would love to. <laughs> Thank you. Please come to Japan also. We would love to have you. Yes. <laughs> so, thank you for the, uh, being with us. Now we can wrap up our uh, inaugural session and we will meet again for the first technical session after lunch. Okay. So, Thank you, Jody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rao. Thank you, our director, sir. Uh, Sarni, shall I, I, I ask you now to deliver the vote of thanks? Are you working with me? Uh, may I request the coordinator for lunch? to deliver the vote of thanks. So lunch virtually, Sarini, that is what sir is asking you. Are we going to have lunch virtually? Are you providing lunch virtually? Yes, thank you so much, Sarini. Uh, respected dignitaries, uh, the esteemed directors of NIT Kesuratkal and NIT Goa, uh, Professor K. Umama Heshwar Rao and uh, Professor Gopal Mugraya, the keynote speaker, Professor Yuri Jodi Yujobo, the deans, faculty members, and my dear friends. A very good afternoon to one and all. An immensely pleasurable day would be witness to academic uh, deliberations and discussions that has a deep connect with the events surrounding us in the present times. At the outset, I wish to thank God for keeping all of us healthy and safe. Here I'm suddenly reminded of uh, Melody Beattie's words, quote unquote, gratitude makes sense of your past, brings peace for today and creates a vision for tomorrow. And yes, it is with immense gratitude that I wish to mention the dynamic arrange, uh, encouragement of uh, Professor Gopal Mugraya, our chief patron and chairperson of Board of Governors, NIT Goa, as well as the director of NIT Goa, who involved himself during every stage, literally every stage of planning this event and boosted our confidence further with today's meaningful welcome address. I also wish to extend my heartfelt acknowledgement to Professor K. Balavi Reddy, our chief patron and chairperson of NIT K. Suratkal, for being the guiding force for the day's program. 
Let me also profusely thank our beloved director uh, of NIT K Suratkal, Professor K Uma Maheshwar Rao, for being the inspirational figure by being part of today's event and for his excellent address. Professor Rao spoke extensively about outcome-based teaching learning approaches and also developing sustainable pedagog uh, pedagogical classes in the coming years. Thank you, Professor, for the valuable insights you gave us. Professor Yuri Jodi Yujogo, Tamagawa University, Tokyo, gave a very interesting and a lucid keynote address and true to her acumen of being a bilingualism researcher and her narratives on developing resources for teaching and assessing communication strategies in ELF informed pedagogy was very interesting. Professor Jodi also mentioned about the challenges faced in the Japanese education system and the steps taken to eradicate the walls between the various multidisciplinary courses in silo education. That was indeed an eye opener. What you told us about the 12 concepts of the Zenjin philosophy is indeed, uh, it was indeed indelible and thought provoking. Finally, her narratives on the significant use of machine language in the present context of the pandemic to keep the academic calendar uh, rolling or relevant was a revelation too. Finally, you ended with a formula to successful global citizens as ELF communicators. We are deeply indebted by the resourcefulness of your address, Professor. Thank you so much. Let me also extend my gratitude to our patron, Professor Anant Narayana, VS, the Deputy Director of NIT Kisradkal, for his encouraging presence in today's program. I will be failing in my duty if I do not mention the robust support extended by each of our patrons, Professor M.S. Bhatt, Dean Faculty Welfare of NIT Kisradkal, Dr. C. Vaijayanti, Dean Faculty Welfare of NIT Goa, Dr. Saeedi Reddy, Dean uh, Research and Consultancy, NIT Goa, Dr. Vasanta, MH, Dean Planning and Development uh, of NIT Goa, Dr. Shashidhar Kudari, Registrar, NIT Goa, and uh, Dr. S. Pavan Kumar, Head of the Department of School of Management, NIT Kisaratkal, and of course, my dear colleagues of the School of Management. I wholeheartedly thank each one of them. Now, due to time constraints, I cannot name each of our academic or technical committee members who had the painful task of scrutinizing every paper before approving. I wish to extend my deep sense of gratitude to each one of them at this juncture. I wish to acknowledge the contributions of the conference chair and every author whose paper stands selected for these two day sessions and I am sure that each of these papers are sure to stimulate an academic investigation among each one in the, in the audience. I wish to graciously thank Professor Ranjan Kinney for accepting our request for a valedictory address on the concluding day, that is tomorrow. Dr. Sarani Ghoshal, a genial soul, had her share of personal challenges since we planned this event way back in the initial months of 2021 but never once did I hear her excusing herself from responsibilities, which proved to be a source of uh, constant encouragement for me as well. And for this, I cannot thank her enough. Thank you so much, Sarani, for being constantly there to support. Our technical team comprising of Mr. Venkat, Mr. Nijin, Mr. Ramiz, Mr. Rohit, and Mr. Nikhil have done a meticulous job along with Mr. Rajkumar and who had uh, who has provided with the logistic support. The team has worked tirelessly to enable the smooth conduct of seamless streaming for today and tomorrow, which needs special mention given the challenging times. And I extend my heartfelt acknowledgement to their efforts. I also take this opportunity to thank the social media team of NIT Kisaratkal for promoting the conference on various social pages of the Institute. Finally, our audience, which I believe are huge in numbers, are our strength and support. I wholeheartedly acknowledge their animated presence through the conduct of this two-day session. So thank you, one and all. Thank you once again. Keep healthy, keep safe. Over to you, Sarani. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So thank you, Sheena. Thank you all. Uh, thank you all the participants. Now we will take a break and uh, we will come back uh, for the first technical session, which will commence from one o'clock. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks.